Mimville City Council on this, March the 24th, 2020, to order. And we'll have Claudia do a roll call of the council. Here. Councilor Peralta. Councilor Peralta. Sorry, I was on mute. I'm here. Council President Minky. Here. Councilor Draskin is absent. And Mayor Hill. Here. Here. Thank, Thank you, Claudia. You, Claudia. Uh, I just want to make mention that I think that we are uh, creating history tonight with the council. This is our first electronic meeting that I've, uh, I'm aware of, and so we'll make note of that. Um, I just also want to make note that here in the Civic Center, uh, I am, I'm here with a number of staff, but as you can take a look at the screen, we have the appropriate uh, social distancing uh, as uh, asked for by the governor. I'd also like to thank staff for all the extra time and effort to make this happen today and MCM, Jerry and his team uh, for making this available on MCM. Uh, with that being said, uh, I think this evening what I would really like to start out to do is do a COVID-19 update from my perspective and then we'll have Jeff to update us from a city perspective. Some of these things that you, some of these things you're already aware of, but I just thought for the record, well, uh, we'd like to kind of go over a few things. I've had the opportunity as mayor to be on four calls with the governor over, over the last, the last two, two weeks. weeks. We, are, we are a part of weekly calls and then we have an update if she's going to make any announcements. The first call is where she's giving us some of uh, the elements of her executive uh, orders and then she's let each mayor speak to concerns that they would have. So there's a two-way dialogue. I just wanted to make sure that you were aware that that is happening at the state level with the governors and the mayors across the state of Oregon. We've also had statewide calls with other partners, uh, such as uh, LOC, some of you may have been a part of those, and then connections with uh, many of the departments that are we're working with at the state level. Many of those uh, come through emails and some of you have been receiving those emails with updates and keeping us completely uh, in, in contact with our partners throughout the state. Uh, as I've indicated, emails uh, from nat uh, national sources, uh, Today, I received uh, emails from uh, uh, Senator Wyden in Merkley's office. Um, Representative uh, uh, Congresswoman Bonamici has uh, sent emails out probably two a week so that we know their involvement and their desire to have communication, communication with us. We've also received from uh, OHA and a number of the other state um, uh, individuals uh, keeping us informed. Um, we've had a countywide conference call with the commissioners, with school district, and with mayors in Yamhill County, and we, we anticipate that this will be uh, happening at least on a weekly basis moving forward. Our first call was last Friday, and that is a part of the programming on MCM if you'd like to uh, see that. Um, I'm going to take just a moment, and we've been able to do a couple of things uh, recently. Um, as, soon as, as soon as we receive information from the governor, we've sent it out to um, you as counselors, and uh, Monday we received um, Executive Order 20-12, and the, the, the governor likes to call this Stay Home, Save Lives and she was directing everyone in Oregon to stay at home to maximize uh, to maximize the extent possible and uh, listing a number of businesses that they have temporarily closed to stem the spread of the COVID-19 in Oregon. Uh, I'm gonna read a couple of things just for the record. Uh, 
the, the governor has asked Oregon's to stay at home and practice social distancing. I know on our call on Sunday, she was uh, taken back at the number of individuals throughout the state that were going to the coast and overwhelming the communities at the coast and, and said that it just becomes so critical that we understand we minimize the, um, the ability to spread the virus. So stay home. Uh, both keeps you safe from infection, ensures that you do not unknowingly uh, infect others. Uh, she's also addressed um, increasing hospital capacity by cutting down non-emergency care, uh, conserving masks, gowns, gloves, and trying to keep our medical workers safe from the virus. We're also trying to keep the infection rate down so that we can preserve um, hospital beds for those that really are going to need this in the future. A couple of other things I'd like to share, all non-essential social recreational gatherings of individuals are prohibited immediately, regardless of size. If a distance, if a distance of at least three feet between individuals cannot be maintained, gatherings of members of the same family are permitted. Again, we set uh, new guidelines for childcare facilities, setting limits and rules on the amount of children allowed in care and outlining that children care groups may not uh, charge uh, or change uh, per, uh, participants. Uh, there are a number of, of uh, retail establishments that are no longer to be open. That would include fitness, gyms, sports, health clubs, exercise studios, grooming, which would be barbershops, beauty, nail salons, and non-medical uh, wellness spas, entertainment, theaters, um, arcades, amusement parks, bowling alleys, pool halls, and shopping outdoor and indoor malls and retail, and retail complexes, all the individual types of businesses, uh, that they just don't want to have large groups coming together. Uh, so that is a summary of the executive order 2012 that came out on Monday. And again, you've had that. I'd also like to uh, share, and many of you have received this also, uh, the status report from the Oregon Health Authority. And as of yesterday, we had, uh, 191 confirmed cases of COVID-19, five deaths reported in Oregon, and 3,649 individuals under investigation with negative test results. Uh, there's a much more detailed report on those types of things. Uh, another thing that I would share, we received from the uh, Oregon Amer or the, the Oregon chapter or the Cascade region of the American Red Cross that says, like a, and, and this is coming from the governor, like a hospital, grocery store, or pharmacy, a blood drive is essential to ensuring the, healthy, the health of our communities and the Red Cross will continue to hold blood drives during this challenging time and you are encouraged to keep your blood donation appointments or schedule one. It also was mentioned that we ought to uh, get this critical uh, message out in all the um, public uh, settings that we can. Uh, let, me sh let me share also with you, uh, this coming Thursday, uh, we meet with MAC leadership, which is the group of, of uh, uh, business leaders, a school, um, education, uh, uh, our nonprofits uh, and and also our government leaders and we're going to look uh, so we'll meet this Thursday we'll be doing it from zoom it'll be an opportunity to share with our our, our business leaders what's happening and also have a dialogue we anticipate that we will be meeting on a weekly basis moving forward but we'll let you know as we have that meeting on Thursday uh, a couple of other things that I would just share with you. Uh, our website has all of the critical 
communication that we've received, and many of that is in Spanish. If we receive it in Spanish, it's in Spanish. That's one thing I think you can tell the citizens of McMinnville. Go to our website for complete updates as it relates to the virus. Um, let me, uh, I, I received a, um, a, an email from Senator uh, Boquist last week. He sits on the uh, COVID-19 task force for the, the state. And he said that because of our stay at home efforts, we've seen the trajectory uh, start to be more like South, uh, South Korea right now. So that's a really positive uh, information coming back to us as we're doing the things that the governors ask us to do. We're seeing uh, some results from that perspective. We know restaurants are closed um, for coming into them, but we still have drive up, drive uh, through and delivery service. Remember to shop locally. The last thing that I'd like to update you on is McMinnville Water and Light. Uh, the offices at McMinnville and Water and Light have closed to uh, um, protect the employees at Water and Light. We've done some rescheduling of how we work our crews so that we don't have them coming together other than in uh, groups of two. Um, water is going to continue to be available, electric, all of those essential services that are provided by Water and Light uh, are up and going. Uh, we are not going to disconnect any individuals for non-payment. Uh, we've also doubled the amount of money we put into uh, assistance for those that can't pay their water or light bill. And uh, we're meeting Friday just to go over a number of other things. Uh, with that being said, I think, uh, Jeff, could you just update us on, from a citywide perspective, what we're doing? Thank you, Mayor, members of council. Um, a fair amount of what I'm going to start with, you already know, and so I'm gonna, um, skip over some of the details. Uh, we essentially have closed all of our public facilities to walk in traffic. That includes playground and other park equipment. Uh, we do have all of our programs responding to calls, emails, and limited meetings by appointment. We've got about 80 employees who are currently working from home. That's about 34% of our workforce. Uh, obviously police, fire, uh, water reclamation facility and our public works field crews are not in that position. That's about 48% of our employees. Um, so those folks are continuing to work and practice um, uh, our health protocols and social distances, so social distancing. The balance of our employees are working in offices where they're able to um, comply with social distancing requirements. We're engaging multiple times with uh, uh, Yamhill County Public Health Office, emergency management in the hospital and a variety of forums. Uh, we're pushing out information on our city services and other government resources to the public and the business community through uh, media releases, social uh, media accounts, website, and some of our partners. Uh, I wanna talk about a couple of areas where we've seen some specific workload impacts. Um, uh, department heads are available to expand on this or answer questions or correct me when and if I get it wrong. Uh, police department's busier than normal, but has generally not required extraordinary efforts. Um, fire department, our call volume is actually steady, but the nature of our calls are impacting our response time. Uh, we're, we're seeing more calls that um, include symptoms that could be attached to the COVID-19 virus. And so we're enacting particular field protocols and cleaning time, in, uh, especially that um, is uh, limiting our ability to, um, uh, to meet our response time standards. So we've currently deployed a fourth ambulance to maintain our response time and we're we're evaluating that on a daily and weekly basis to see how long we'll continue to do that. Community development has been impacted by leave and vacancies in some key work areas. The water reclamation facility has rehired a retired employee and has plans for reassignment to maintain operations. And we've started, um, we'll start this week having our field crews working staggered schedules to focus on essential tasks and maintain capacity for call outs. Um, we've been involved in discussions with school district and other stakeholders regarding um, child care for health care and emergency response workers. Uh, we've deployed sanitation and hand washing services for people without homes and we're exploring shelter solutions with providers and other stakeholders. Uh, we're also exploring business support programs with our stable table partners. 
Um, I want to encourage people to stay safe, to support their family and friends, to support the local businesses that are open with food to go or gift certificates for future use. Uh, the mayor talked a little bit about water and lights, um, customers helping customers program. We'd like to expand that to include sewer bills this year for the first time. Uh, the utility would make a contribution to match customer contributions. The program's administered through Water and Light by St. Vincent de Paul. Um, we'd like to get the council's consensus tonight to work with Water and Light to launch that program and bring back a formal um, recommendation for you to ratify at a future council meeting if you're comfortable with that. We could see sort of a heads up, uh, a thumbs up or a nod from folks if you'd like us to work on that issue. Appreciate that. So Mike, Mike will be the staff lead on that. We'll be, we'll have more to, um, to share about that at your next council meeting. I want to close with a couple of quotes and a thank you. Um, George Hawkins is the retired executive director of DC Water, and he says, in the context of what we're dealing with right now, we all want to be on site. We all want to do our part. I used to feel that everyone from DC water was essential, but that's just a definition on who's there in an emergency. It's not about the value they provide. And I think it's important for folks to remember uh, that when you're, um, when you're looking at the city services and the people providing it. Also wanna share a quote from Stephen Covey. Just as we develop our physical mus muscles through overcoming opposition, such as lifting weights, we develop our character muscles by overcoming challenges and adversity. I want to tell you that I am so impressed with the people who work in this organization. I work more closely with the executive team than with others, obviously, but I come in contact and see the work of people throughout the organization. People that work for the city of McMinnville are not shrinking from their responsibility. They're stepping up in a way that makes me incredibly proud, and I hope that you're all proud of them as well. Thank you for the time, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Jeff. And uh, from a council perspective, we recognize the hard work that's being put on by our uh, our staff. And in trying times, you know, your focus is around your family and for their health. And we're able to allow so many work from home. And we've trained uh, fire, mm -hmm. police, and those out in the community to do what they do safely and protecting. So take that message back. Uh, department heads, we truly understand that uh, big lift that's happening throughout the city. Um, what I'd like to do at this point is uh, go to the advice. Um, I know many of you have been in contact with myself and with Jeff through emails and know that those emails are being looked at and they're being talked about. But what I'd like to do at this point, I know we've not had many committee or board assignment meetings, but is there any reports from counselors uh, that you would like to make to fellow counselors at this point? Uh, this is Sal, Mr. Mayor, uh, thank you for that uh, segue. I just have a brief report from the Mid Valley COG. Um, first, I just wanna say uh, the thanks to you, Mr. Mayor, for your work uh, to make our city a leader in taking early steps to address this emergency, not only within the city, but also getting the Mac Water and Light Board uh, to ensure that people don't lose connection during the economic hardships. Um, I'd also like to recognize both Kylie and Jeff and the rest of our management staff team for developing the uh, HR protocols that they have to enable our staff to work from home. I think it's important to recognize that the Mid Valley COG adopted uh, wholesale the uh, policies that Kylie and Jeff developed uh, and other management staff in Renville developed and those have been pushed out to other cities. So that was, I felt, a real example of uh, leadership uh, from our city. Um, the Mid Valley COP was placed on the governor's uh, regional solutions team. Uh, so through that board, I've been working with the COG to encourage uh, statewide policy to improve self, uh, health and sanitation policy at our grocery stores and other big box retailers. Uh, I shared my report with the Joint Legislative Committee on the COVID-19 response. I sent that also to staff. Uh, folks are welcome to um, read that if they'd care to. Um, and then this is not really apropos of the COG, but I just wanted to acknowledge that uh, several businesses, including the Downtown Association, 
are asking our city to take an increased role to protect uh, some of our local iconic downtown businesses from the economic fallout of this. Uh, and uh, I've also had several requests from community members to uh, for the city to take additional steps to bolster the Meals on Wheels capacity to deliver to seniors uh, and then similar programs to help people who may be out of work right now. Um, and so I'm, I'm not sure what opportunities we're going to have to kind of plug those ideas out, but I sure would like an opportunity to do that tonight. Uh, Sal, you were you were breaking up a little bit. I don't know if um, we heard you as clearly, at least at at the dais. I you you faded out in and out a, a number of times. Jeff, were you able to hear his full request? You're on mute, Jeff. Oh, yes, I am on mute. I I, I think I got the essence of it. Uh, I, I think the key two action items that. Um, Councilor Peralta was talking about was um, uh, making sure that we are able to support getting food to people in need uh, through Meals on Wheels or other efforts and also to explore um, uh, uh, some kind of a business assistance program uh, specifically but not exclusively focused on the downtown. Um, and uh, Heather and I have both been in contact with the downtown association and with MEDP specifically about that as well as with a couple of cities who are providing that program. Does that capture what you were talking about, Sal? Yes, it does. I'm sorry about the mic issues, folks. I'm having a slight network difficulties on my end. Okay. And Sal, we did we, we did see your email, and and I know that Heather's a part of that, so that will be something that I think we can have further discussion with, uh, and and let staff give Jeff some information and get back to the council on. Uh, uh, that, uh, I, that's what I feel might be appropriate at this point. I, I've reached out and talked to the mayor of Hillsborough because they've set a certain amount of money, a uh, hundred thousand, uh, for that types of uh, assistance. And so I called uh, Mayor Callaway and asked him how he did that. And they're using their uh, community block grant money, and then they have something that's called an SIP, which would be a strategic investment plan, where they plan way ahead of time to put money aside for the, not necessarily these kinds of disasters, but they put it aside. And so we need to take a little more look into um, the Beavertons and some of the others that have uh, been able to do that. Uh, I, I, I know we have a desire and we may have a capacity, but we truly need to do it the right way. And so Jeff, if you could have yourself and staff take a look at that and get back to us, I think that's how I would like to approach it. Does that sound okay, Sal? Uh, yeah, it does, Mr. Mayor. The one caveat that I would make is, uh, you know, uh, time is of the essence for the businesses that are uh, in this situation. Time is of the essence for the employees that have been laid off. So I realize that we have the capacity that we have, but I, I do think that it's important that we move as quickly as possible, as humanly possible to take steps. You know, you, you noted that both or have been able to move forward. Of course, they're city where we are, but I do think this is an opportunity, another opportunity for us to show a strong leadership in this area. I, I would agree, and I, I don't think that I would hold this off till our next council meeting if that's something that the staff says we have capacity and we find a way to do that. I know the SBA is working on programs right now. Jody Christensen's role has changed uh, at the uh, as a regional solutions director. She's now the regional uh, solutions uh, 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 rebuilding of economic in our community so we we have someone that we know very well and we're going to be jody will be on our call on thursday as we meet with leadership mac the the group to get some input from there and we'll reach out to you and the counselors after that meeting uh kelly you had just a second kelly you had your hand up yeah um i don't have any committee uh Reports, but uh, I did attend the YCAP meeting today. <clears throat> it was basically an information update. 
Uh, they have uh, three things that are their top challenge right now. Uh, one is identifying how to deal with uh, fiscal challenges because they're concerned about having enough money to pay their people and other sort of things. Uh, they're not going out and soliciting uh, from smaller businesses because they know they're very hard hit, but they are uh, soliciting the larger organizations. Uh, while we were on the line with Alexandria today, actually they actually got a $43,000 grant from the Oregon Community Foundation. Uh, the other thing is staffing in general. Uh, her, the concern is to keep everybody working. She can do that through this week. She's not sure after it. But uh, because of certain grant situations, there, she's not certain how well she can move her employees from different departments. Uh, the third thing is just the stress of scenario there's a lot on their plate right now but they are keeping all of the, their departments are open a number of them are essential services and they're doing their level best to keep things moving uh, probably uh that's about it but i just wanted you to know that uh, they're an organization that's working hard to keep things going and be helpful to everyone. Uh, the good news was that a lot of the food banks are operating and operating fairly busy. Uh, Thank not you. food banks, but the soup kitchens. And things. Oh, the soup kitchens, yes. So they're providing a lot of food out there. She said uh, she's concerned about they're going to need more than what they would normally have. Right now they can fulfill normal requests, but they're not certain if they'll be able to uh, as time goes on. Thank you, Kelly. Let's move over to Zach. Yeah, I wanted to go back to Sal's topic and echo everything that Sal said and, and anything we can do in the immediate future to buy local businesses and local people struggling the most at that razor edge is, is tantamount at the moment. And, um, I think those two areas that were specific to that hi highlighted from Jeff are important and just wanted to see if South specific items you wanted to discuss as a direct response we can do right away. Was that question to me or just generally to the group? Uh, it was to you specifically, is there any more individual direct items we can do to respond to COVID and, and our local businesses or people? Yeah, the, the two main concerns that I've had, uh, well, the, the three concerns two that I mentioned were uh, protective taking local businesses, and there were some specific requests made by uh, folks at MBA, including developing maybe a little more um, specific instruments to, for businesses to identify the economic harm from COVID. And then uh, that, that particularly related to the, the rents that downtown businesses are paying. Uh, second, um, I mentioned the Meals on Meals, I think, in enough specificity. And then third, reducing the uh, long-term uh, growth of the spread of the disease um, in core businesses like uh, grocers and uh, other big box retailers that have to stay open. Uh, we're reliant on for, uh, you know, key supplies for folks in the city. Um, I, you know, that those areas of places in large congregations of people going. So I think it's important that, uh, you know, we try to take a leap for the state, uh, statewide policy uh, to uh, strengthen the state. And uh, if the state isn't going to adopt some standard protocols, I think that we should consider that uh, in coalition with regional partners to protect the health of folks here in town. And I'm not, I, I hope everybody heard all of that. I heard a good amount of it. Um, the other thing that I think is neat that the city of Lafayette's doing as a, a credit back for those that are patronizing their local downtown. Uh, it's on their their water bill, I believe, but I know we don't have jurisdiction over that, but possibly if we could create a credit program like they're doing with sewer fees uh, with the healthiness of the wastewater fund, but that would be a larger discussion among 
youth staff and Jeff and the mayor and um, I'm open to conversations of approaching it that way as well. I know we'd have a lot more business than they do, so it'd be harder to manage, but just something to think about. Okay. I, I think I think Jeff's been taking notes on that and we can take a look at what our capacity is uh, from that perspective. Okay. Um, Wendy, do you have a report or any comments? And then uh, uh, again, Adam, if you have any reports also, you feel free to finish up. I haven't uh, had any meetings. Um, we haven't, uh, haven't had a scheduled MURAC, um, so nothing's been canceled or anything. Um, it would be the first Wednesday of every month. But I would like to support um, what other counselors have talked about. I think that it's a really um, important time for us to be creative about how we can support each other uh, through this, including our local industry, our local businesses that are um, working to continue to provide services uh, under these restrictions. And so I'm in support of, talk, of expanding our dialogue around that. Um, and so I, I would just like to, I know it's more difficult to maintain our connection and dialogue around this with the um, social distancing and things like that, but I think we should be proactive about, um, about looking for opportunities for us to be able to facilitate that kind of uh, support of our community. So that's, I, I think some great ideas have been brought up. So I'd like to hear how we can pursue them. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, go back to Adam. Did you have any further comments, Adam? Uh, we had a WICOM meeting before everything started getting canceled. Um, in that meeting, there was some concern over the amount of calls that they, they're shown in the budget, but it wasn't just uh, from us. It was among all users. And kind of what it's been narrowed down to is it's how the new CAD system is pulling it out. So everybody's percentages are staying the same, but I know there's some concern among other users with YCOM as well as I had some. Um, I talked with Rich about it a little bit and, you know, it just seems like it's more of a new CAD program and he fought that as well when he was pulling numbers out for the feasibility study. So if anything else comes of that, I'll keep you guys uh, updated on that. But I think it's just the way the algorithms changed and how that new software is pulling it out. Um, Outside of that, we haven't had another airport commission meeting and we're postponing um, meeting for new commercial standards until this stuff uh, passes. So I appreciated Mike B's call on moving that down the road. Um, I think that was the right call and I know the other commissioners appreciated it as well. Thanks, Adam. Um, well, with that being said, any further uh, dialogue, I, I can tell you that as Jeff and I and any member of the council would be um, welcome to join our MAC leadership uh, council on Thursday. I think Jeff sent information out to that, but that's where we can get some information back from our business, uh, schools, hospitals, uh, and and further our dialogue around maybe what assistance and what might be appropriate. And I know Jeff's in the throes of, of the budget right now, so he might be able to be more attuned to where we might be and we could bring some information back to the council. Hearing, no, go ahead, Adam. So if we were to listen in from a Zoom on that meeting, is that what you're saying? Would we need to notify you in case we had corn for that? Uh, Jeff, I don't know that we thought about that, but yes, we probably, I think if you would like to be a part of that, uh, let Jeff know and then we will we'll make a determination how that could happen. Right now, Jeff and I are the only ones that are on that standing committee. We're going to take it over so it's not going to be run typically from the chamber or Mark Siegel, but we're going to be taking that as our way of communicating with businesses and leaders in the community. We can just do a notice that um, uh, indicates that a uh, uh, majority of the council may be present, but that it's not a council meeting and there won't be any deliberations towards a decision. 
Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to receive a notice for the Zoom login for that. I'd like to attend. Yeah, me as well. We'll make sure we get that out to all of the council. Thank you. Okay, that moves us to our consent agenda this evening. We have two items on the consent agenda. Is there anyone on the council that would request to remove an item from the consent agenda and to be placed on our regular uh, agenda? Hearing none, then I'll ask for a motion to approve the consent agenda. I have, I have one question real quick. It's more for Mike on that airport lease. Okay. I'm curious if that was the same land that they've been farming or if that's land, different land that they've been farming and what prompted the double in the lease rate. I mean, it's good for us, but it just seems unprecedented to double the lease rate. Yeah, I was approached by uh, Gary Van Hollen a uh, month or so ago uh, when he determined that his uh, fall planting had failed and he had asked if there was a possibility to do an extension in the lease, um, amend it for a longer period of time than's currently allowed. Um, I noted to him at the time that we had updated our other farm leases uh, citywide, both at the airport and at the treatment plant and the current lease rates were quite a bit higher than he was paying. And uh, it was my recommendation that he consider a lease rate that was more commensurate with the other lease rates so that um, it was an easier decision for both staff and policymakers to make. The only other question I have, is there anything in this new lease that he's not gonna be performing it as in if he was doing any runway spraying or anything like that, or if that's still all in the cowards? Yeah, so um, I didn't answer your first question. This is the same property that he has been leasing. It's directly across um, airport road uh, from the uh, edge of the runway. Um, and there aren't any special uh, lease considerations uh, proposed as part of this amendment. Okay, with that, I would be fine seconding uh, Council President Minky's motion on the consent okay. agenda. Okay, so it has been moved by uh, Kelly and seconded by Adam. All in favor of, uh, of approving the um, consent agenda as presented, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The consent agenda uh, passes unanimously this evening, uh, five to zero. We have uh, two resolutions this evening under consideration. Uh, and so I'll go ahead and uh, the first resolution is resolution 2020-18, a resolution for the city of McMinnville ratifying the declaration of the state of emergency signed by Mayor Scott Hill on March 16th. I'll call on uh, uh, Fire Chief uh, Rich Lippert to uh, just kind of go over that basically and then call for discussion. Rich. It'll be just a moment while we wait for, okay, we've got you go. Uh, Mr. Mayor and Councilors, uh, the um, emergency operations plan requires uh, ratification of uh, an emergency, de uh, emergency declaration by the mayor uh, as soon as the group can be gathered together. Uh, this was the first meeting scheduled after the uh, mayor declared the state of emergency. Um, and this um, basically um, concludes the, um, the determination of the state of emergency and then puts the city in a position to um, work through the emergency processes and access uh, additional funding if available through state and federal resources. Any questions for the chief? Uh, chief, I have a couple of questions. Um, do you have a sense yet of the uh, scope of the um, emergency federal relief? I know it's still being debated in Congress, but I, my understanding is that there are certain actions that they've already taken and in particular I'm curious about um, uh, reimbursement for um, 
for city payroll uh, related to the, or, or, or loss of revenue related to the emergency. And then similarly, if we're aware of anything that's already been released, whether it's through the SBA or other organizations uh, federally to provide relief to our business owners and, uh, and people who have been laid off. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of anything specific. I know there is language. I'm not aware of anything specific, but I know there is language uh, regarding certain things that would fall into the category of reimbursement. And I can get that information to you uh, when I get back to my office, Ms. Uh, Councilor Peralta. I just don't have that with me at this point in time. Some of the uh, items like uh, staffing due to the coronavirus for um, uh, healthcare responder and responders though, do fall into that uh, category. Uh, supplies, equipment due to the coronavirus. Uh, but some of the items that, uh, that are outside the scope of that, like the uh, SBA uh, information and some of those items, I do not have uh, that on my desktop at this point in time, but I can sure take a look at it and get back to you. Thank you, Chief. Uh, one more comment real quickly. I, I forgot to um, recognize uh, you, Chief Leipert, uh, and your staff for the speed with which you uh, implemented the safety protocols. I'm not sure how many people in our city are aware, but Albany uh, lost a five person crew to quarantine uh, because they were out of concerns that they had been exposed to the virus uh, very early in this. And uh, the fact that uh, you've been able to keep your crew safe is something that I greatly appreciate. Uh, we have a good team. They've been doing a great job for us. Thank you, Sal. Uh, any other discussion? I'd just like to take the opportunity to also acknowledge um, the police and fire and um, the rest of our staff. I, I failed to do that earlier um, in this emergency. I have been very impressed with the response, uh, how quickly we've responded and how efficiently we've worked together as a, as a team. Um, within our organization. And I think it shows with regards to how ready we are for whatever is to come. So thank you so much for the work that you and your team do, Chief Whiteford. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, so what I will do is ask for a motion to approve resolution 2020-18. I have one more question for Rich. Go um, ahead. With this emergency and running that fourth 24 hour card, that fourth 24 hour car is just during this emergency and uh, how's the morale been with your staff with that extra, those extra work backs or overtime? The, uh, it, it is just for the duration of the emergency and, and we're, we're monitoring day by day as to the need for the, uh, uh, the 24 hour car and the peak unit. Um, as, as we transition and hopefully make it past the bell curve, um, it, we are using overtime hours to staff it but so far we haven't had to force uh, mandatorily hold over anyone. They've all voluntarily staffed it. I think that all of our crews understand the, the nature of the severity of the situation that we're in and are participating in, in uh, helping us work through the backside. And, and the morale of the crews, I think given, I mean, there's, there's always questions and concerns and anxiety uh, in, the, in our realm and our world. And um, I think the challenge that we have is Normally, uh, the, the folks that we work with at the fire department are used to placing themselves in harm's way, but this is something that, that they're working through the dynamic of their family being potentially in harm's way at the same time they're at work, uh, placing themselves in harm's way. So it's a whole different um, perspective for them. Um, and, but we do have, just to keep you uh, informed, we do have um, an on-call uh, on professional counselor available for them um, at, at any time they need to uh, have, have contact with that counselor. Um, she runs our peer support program and manages um, both our internal peer support program as well as um, our uh, counseling efforts that we provide for our, our groups. Uh, Chief, Chief, sorry to interrupt. I had, I had one other question that was raised by staff in fire. Uh, there was a concern. Uh, I understand they're going to use Station 12 if there is a uh, if if there is a need to quarantine staff. Uh, there was uh, were questions among staff as to whether uh, they'd be able to use hotel rooms if Station 12 happens to fill up, so that they don't have to quarantine at home and potentially risk exposing their their families. And I was wondering if any arrangements you're able to make any movement on getting those arrangements for staff. Council Peralta, we haven't made any arrangements at this point in time. 
Our goal is to make sure we're wearing PPE on every call and that way we don't have to worry about the quarantine. Um, we've been uh, advising them to wear PPE, uh, uh, preliminary screen pre PPE, the lower level, going into anything that may be suspicious, um, even if it's not coming in as those primary calls. And they've been doing a really good job of doing that and tracking. And also our, our uh, protocols now uh, through OHA have changed. Um, even if we have the suspicion of a um, contamination of an employee, um, until we're, we're verified with a positive test, the individual would not be quarantined until symptoms showed. Um, so we wouldn't be necessarily grabbing someone off of the line and putting them into quarantine. It might be two, three to five days later till we find out um, that they actually were exposed to someone who maybe we didn't know at the time had, had uh, the virus. And then they still wouldn't be placed in quarantine until they themselves started to show symptoms. So they would be they would be quarantined at home. But if we decided to create a, a separate space entirely, so they didn't have to go home, uh, that would be a, a a process we'd have to work through with some sort of contractual obligation, probably with local hotels who apparently have some space available currently. How's your stock of PPE? Um, we have an outstanding group of scroungers, and um, and we have and I'm, I'm serious, and we have. Uh, uh, Fortunately, we're in a rural community where there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of farming industry and there's a lot of wine industry that requires similar types and levels of PPE for certain uh, levels of work. And there's been a lot of folks out there uh, being supportive of us. And so we're, we're, not, um, we're not reusing PPE, but we definitely are, um, we're, we're, we're keeping up with, with the flow. Um, but we are in a position where we have a, about a week or two and if, uh, has continued. But we have, I myself am working with vendors directly in China trying to get some, some PPE here. We have people working with 3M directly. Uh, we've ordered large amounts of PPE. It's just when can it get here and can it get here in time. And, and our local communities have been very supportive in, in dropping off supplies. And we've been taking stuff over to public health that we have a good supply of and trying to share with the rest of the, with the, rest of the community. Great, thank you. Any other questions? I would move to approve the City of McMinnville's emergency Second. declaration and the mayor's declaration. Second. Thank you. It has been moved by Zach and seconded by Kelly. All those in favor uh, to approve resolution 2020-18, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please signify by saying nay. Resolution 2018 passes unanim unanimously uh, five to zero. That takes us to our second resolution tonight, 2020-19, a resolution approving the award of a personal services contract to Jacobs for phase one of the water reclamation facility uh, biosolid storage tank and the grit system expansion. That's project 2019-10. We'll call on Mike to update us and uh, through this discussion. Mike. Thank you, Mayor and members of the council. I'll refer you to your brief staff report that's in your packet by uh, engineering services manager, Larry Sherwood. Also included is the draft resolution the original request for proposal documents that we issued uh, late last calendar year, the submittal we received from Jacobs, the negotiated scope of work and estimate, as well as a site map that shows you uh, the configuration at the treatment plant. Uh, much like we've uh, handled our uh, last several large uh, treatment plant projects, we're proposing that this work be, this design work be phased so that we do a uh, pretty detailed holistic analysis up front that evaluates the process needs and the constraints before we select uh, engineering solution. Uh, uh, the last two projects, the treatment plant expansion and the UV expansion project went very smoothly because of that approach. And uh, we recommend that we continue along those lines. What you'll see this evening is phase one of that work, which is gets us through um, that initial analysis uh, will be before you at a future date with a detailed design package as well as construction phases. It's anticipated that this phase one of the work will occur this calendar year and the estimated cost for the work is $255,541. With that, I'd answer any questions you might have and I'd recommend that you adopt the resolution as presented. 
Any questions for Mike? Hearing none, then let's go ahead and I'll take a motion for resolution 2020-19. So moved. Second. It's been moved. Was that Sal? No, it's me. Uh, I, well, I moved. I don't okay, know. so Wendy. Wendy, Wendy moved and then Kelly seconded. All those in favor of approving resolution 2020-19, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Indicate by saying nay. Resolution 2020-19 passes unanimously five to zero. Next, it takes us to our ordinances this evening. The next six items on the agenda are ordinances uh, 5084, right. ordinance 5085, ordinance 5086, ordinance 5087, ordinance 5088, and ordinance 50. 89. These are all related to one development project, but are separate land use uh, decisions. Uh, if no one objects, I would like to suggest that we have staff present on all six of them in one staff report and then vote on each ordinance separately. Anyone object to that? Uh, I have a parliamentary question, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Is, is it allowable for us as part of this process to um, memorialize the vote that we took at the previous meeting um, rather than re-voting on, on each ordinance separately? Uh, Spencer's uh, with us tonight representing our legal counsel. Uh, Spencer, I'll turn that over to you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Councilor Peralta, I, I think it would be advisable to just to uh, maintain a clean record in in the council's action that we go through the process of doing it again because what happened in essence last time was that we went through second readings that um, didn't comply with the charter requirements. So what we'd need to do is a second reading for those again, just to make sure that we are complying with that charter requirement. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And Mr. Mayor, if I could add one other thing, and um, we didn't get it into the script, but I just wanted to um, ask that you check with the counselors and make sure nobody had had any ex parte contacts between the last meeting and tonight. Uh, Thank you, Spencer. So if anyone has had ex parte contact since our last meeting uh, two weeks ago, please disclose that at this point. Yeah, that's, uh, I would like to disclose uh, that at the end of the last meeting, uh, I was approached by uh, uh, two opponents uh, uh, to the, um, uh, the measure, uh, and they had overheard part of a conversation that was more generic that you and I had had, Mr. Mayor, about traffic flows in that area and had misunderstood the nature of that conversation. So I explained it to them, and then they... Uh, there proceeded to be a little bit more of a conversation around that. Um, uh, it won't affect my vote, but I did want to acknowledge it for the record that there was uh, some ex parte contact after the previous meeting. Thank you, Sal. Anyone else? Hearing none, then Spencer, I think uh, we've we've uh, addressed that. Um, yes, sir, Mr. Mayor, you should just, um, for purposes of the meeting, just ask if anyone wants to uh, rebut um, Councillor Peralta's statement. Okay. And so we'll ask at this time if anyone would like to rebut uh, Councillor uh, uh, Peralta's uh, statement. Seeing none, then I think we can move forward. Okay, um, and so if, I, if I'm not mistaken, uh, no one on the council, uh, w they will allow us to address all the ordinances with a staff report and then we will vote individually on each of the ordinances. Is that correct? Seeing no one uh, in opposition to that, I'll now call on Senior Planner Chuck Don Donnell to present uh, uh, the ordinances and update us with anything that he needs to, to do. So Chuck, we'll welcome you. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Councilors. Um, I'll provide just a brief overview of the ordinances and the land use applications that are before you tonight uh, for those of uh, those that might be watching or listening tonight. Um, and then I'll provide a little overview of the conversation that happened at the March 10th meeting as well. Um, so the six ordinances that are before you tonight are for six separate land use applications for the Baker Creek North project. Uh, they include a comprehensive plan, map amendment, zone change, uh, plan development amendment, a new plan development overlay district, a tentative subdivision, and a landscape plan. Um, the approval of the six applications uh, would allow for that Baker Creek North project to be developed, uh, which includes a 10-phase, 280-lot single-family subdivision uh, with all the associated public improvements and public and private open spaces. It also includes a 6.62 acre commercial site at the corner of Hill and Baker Creek Road. Uh, just to clarify, there are no specific development plans yet for that commercial site as part of the applications, uh, but those would be submitted for review by the Planning Commission at a future date. Uh, there are some conditions of approval that would be associated with that commercial site, uh, including site and building design standards that would need to be followed and achieved would be reviewed by the Planning Commission at that time. Um, the council has reviewed this over the course of a few meetings. Uh, the council held, held a public hearing on January 28th, uh, held the record open uh, for the submittal of additional written testimony. Council received that at the March 10th meeting and held their first and second readings of the uh, each of the six ordinances on the, at that March 10th meeting. Um, like Spencer just mentioned a moment ago, uh, not all of the approvals of those ordinances uh, were unanimous. So based on our city charter provisions, they're coming back before you tonight for another reading and for enactment um, because they were not unanimous at that previous meeting. Um, at the March 10th meeting, there was deliberation and discussion of a few amendments to one of the ordinances uh, during that meeting. Uh, those were to the plan development amendment uh, which is ordinance 5086. Uh, those deal with the commercial site, that 6.62 acre uh, commercial site on the corner of Hill and Baker Creek Roads. Uh, the amendments that were discussed with motions and, and votes made to make the amendments uh, include uh, some changes to the conditions of approval. Those include uh, prohibiting standalone drive-through facilities, limiting the building height uh, to only two stories rather than a specific number of feet, uh, and then requiring that the future traffic impact analysis that's required to be completed prior to any commercial development, that that include specifically an analysis of the intersections of Baker Creek Road and Michael Book Lane and Baker Creek Road and Highway 99. Not uh, only those, but that those uh, be included. Uh, staff prepared an amended ordinance uh, 5086 that incorporates those amendments uh, based on the deliberation and the uh, discussions at the last council meeting on March 10th. Those amendments are described in detail in the staff report. Uh, we highlighted those amendments to the, to the language that changed. Uh, some of the conditions of approval were amended and also the findings to support those conditions of approval. So those are all uh, identified in detail in your packet. Um, and again, we highlighted those specific findings that were amended as well, based on those conditions of approval. Um, so, so tonight, the procedure would be uh, another reading of each of the ordinances, uh, following which the council can make a motion to take action on each of the ordinances individually. Um, Legal counsel Spencer Parsons is, is uh, available tonight to answer any questions that might, you might have uh, in terms of procedures. Um, but with that, I'd, I'd welcome any questions that the council has for staff at this point. So do we have any questions of Chuck? Hearing none, then um, as the city council members, well, thank you, Chuck, for your overview and discussion on that. So as city council members might recall, the ordinances did not have unanimous support at our last meeting, and that requires a second reading to be conducted at a, a separate meeting, and that is this evening. Unless any members request otherwise, I will ask the city attorney to read the ordinance by title only. Mr. Mr. Mayor, point of order? Yes. 
Brian Cavanis, applicant, Stafford Land Company. Yes. Um, Mr. Mayor, given the importance and significance of this pro project, um, we've noticed that the council does not have a full membership. And what we would uh, request is, that, request or rather suggest is that the hearing be set over uh, to a date certain in April to provide the entire council an opportunity to participate in this matter? S Spencer, I'll turn that over to you. Mr. Mayor, we've, re we've just received an email from Mr. Kavanaugh saying that if the council um, would be willing to set it over to the April date, they would extend the 120 day rule. But that's a, that is a question for the council. The council can go forward or they can uh, grant the request by the applicant at this point. They're, they're, they're not obligated to, but you are not obligated to, but you certainly may. Uh, could I say something? I think Remy's trying to join. I don't, I, she's having some problems. Is she gonna try to join on Zoom or by phone? Uh, Remy, are you trying to join by Zoom or on the phone? <laughs> She's on the phone with me. <laughs> uh, Claudia, Claudia sent out a preliminary email that if you touch the, if you touch the, uh... okay, she's got it open and it's loading. Okay. Spencer, can I ask a question while we wait for Remy to potentially jump in? Sure. Why, uh, why are they making this request? Um, Councilor Gary, I'm not sure other than the reason that Mr. Cavanis just provided to the council that they would prefer to have the vote of the full council. Is there any difference? Kelly, can you mute yours while you try and figure yeah. out how to, um, Spencer, is there any difference in the vote if you know, Remy, Councillor Drapkin was there previous and is not here now. Uh, no, there's, there's, there's no reason that if, if the council has a quorum present, the council can take action on the ordinances, including uh, voting on their passage after the second reading is conducted. You know, you know, the second reading that we're doing tonight to comply with the charter requirement. Um, okay. I, I think that I would, uh, if Remy's able to get on, I would encourage us to just wait till she's able to uh, get on to uh, participate. Um, however, if she's not able to get on, I, I would right think, now. oh, she's here. So we'll skip the second half of what I was going to say. And okay, so let me, let me do this. Remy, you are now uh, on Zoom. Yes. Thank you. Uh, we have just had... Uh, mm -hmm. Chuck, go over uh, the ordinances, the six ordinances, and give a brief report to us uh, as we left it two weeks ago. And so I am now to a point where, uh, just reminding everybody on the city council that two weeks ago we were not able to have a unanimous uh, decision. And so we're to a point where we would have the second reading again by title only. Uh, Council, do we feel do we feel comfortable moving forward? Give me a give me a thumbs up if you are. I'm good. Okay. Okay, Spencer. Then what I would have you do is to uh, to uh, do a second reading of ordinance number fifty eighty four and read that by title only. Thank you, Mayor. This is the second reading of ordinance number 5084, an ordinance amending the comprehensive plan map designation of the property at the Northeast quadrant of the intersection of Northwest Hill Road and Northwest Baker Creek Road from a commercial designation to a mix of residential and commercial designations. Thank you, Spencer. Uh, any discussions on uh, ordinance number 
hearing none, then I'll ask for a motion to adopt ordinance number 5084. So moved. So moved. Second. It's been moved by Kelly, seconded by Wendy. I'll ask the city recorder to poll the council. I don't hear it, but I know I go first. Aye. Councillor Drapkin. Councillor Garvin. You're still muted, Adam. Councillor Garvin. Aye. Councillor Geary. Aye. Councillor Staffen. Aye. Councillor Peralta. Aye. And Council President Minky. Aye. Okay. Um, after the roll call, uh, ordinance number 5084 uh, passes by a vote of five to one. Okay. Let's move down. This is the second reading mm -hmm. of ordinance 5085, and we'll have uh, uh, Spencer read that by title only. This is the second reading of ordinance number 5085, an ordinance approving a zone change of the property at the northeast quadrant of the intersection of Northwest Hill Road and Northwest Baker Creek Road from a mix of R1 single family residential and EF80 exclusive farm use to C3 general commercial and R4 multi, multiple family residential. Thank you, Spencer. Uh, Council, uh, have any discussion on this ordinance? Hearing none, I will ask for a motion to adopt ordinance number 5085. So moved. Second. A second. It's been, uh, uh, the motion uh, has been moved by Sal and seconded by uh, Kelly. Um, and so I'll ask the city recorder to poll the council. Councillor Drapkin. Aye. Councillor Garvin. Nay. Councillor Geary. Nay. Councillor Staffen. Aye. Councillor Peralta. Aye. And Council President Minky. Aye. Thank you. Um, I'm just getting to my pages. Um, ordinance number 5085 uh, passes with a vote of four to two. Uh, so uh, we'll move forward. This is the second reading of ordinance 5086 and we'll ask Spencer to read that by title only. This is the reading of ordinance number 5086, an ordinance approving a plan development amendment to amend the conditions of approval and reduce the size of an existing plan development overlay district at the northeast quadrant of the intersection of Northwest Hill Road and Northwest Baker Creek Road. Any discussion on ordinance 5086? Hearing none, I'll ask for a motion. So moved. Second. That was moved by Kelly and seconded by Sal. I'll ask the city recorder to poll the council. Councillor Drapkin. Aye. Councillor Garvin. Nay. Councillor Geary. Nay. Councillor Staffen. Aye. Councillor Peralta. Aye. And Council President Minky. Aye. After the roll call, ordinance number 5086 passes with a vote of four to two. This ordinance passes. Let's move to, this is a reading of the, uh, uh, the second reading of ordinance number 5087. And I'll have Spencer read that by title only. Thank you, Mayor. This is the second reading of Ordinance 5087, an ordinance approving a planned development overlay district to allow for the development of a 280 lot residential subdivision with modifications from the underlying zoning requirements at the northeast quadrant of the intersection of Northwest Hill Road and Northwest Baker Creek Road. I'll ask for a motion. 
So moved. A second? Second. It's been moved by Kelly and seconded by Wendy. I'll ask the city recorder to poll the council. All right. Oh, was there any discussion? Yeah, um, well, I guess maybe not discussion, but I'd still like to go back and, and reiterate my disagreement with how this passes 17.51030C1 and how this has special physical conditions or objectives of a development which the proposal will satisfy to warrant a departure from the standard regulation requirements. Um, reading again the applicant's response to that specific criteria, uh, and there are 11 points on how this is um, super distinct and special to the city of McMinnville forever. I still don't uh, agree or see how it meets that uh, in full. Thank you, Zach. Could, could we have the ordinance reread one more time, please? Spencer. Ordinance number 5087, an ordinance approving a plan development overlay district to allow for the development of a 280 lot residential subdivision with modifications from the underlying zoning requirements at the northeast quadrant of the intersection of Northwest Hill Road and Northwest Baker Creek Road. Again, any further discussion? Hearing none, it has been moved by Kelly and seconded by Wendy. I'll ask the city recorder to poll the council. Councilor Drapkin? Aye. Councilor Garvin? Aye. Nay. Councilor Geary? Nay. Councilor Staffens? Aye. Councilor Peralta? Aye. And Council President Minky? Aye. After the roll call ordinance number 5087 uh, passes four to two. Okay, that'll take us to, uh, this is the second reading of ordinance 5088. And I'll ask Spencer to read that by title only. This is the second reading of ordinance number 5088, an ordinance approving a, a tentative subdivision for a 280 lot phased single family detached residential development at the northeast quadrant of the intersection of Northwest Hill Road and Northwest Baker Creek Road. Thank you, Spencer. A council discussion? Hearing none, I will ask for a motion. I so move. A second? Second. It has been moved by uh, Kelly and seconded by Wendy. I'll ask the Thank city Remy. recorder to pull the Remy council. Remy. Remy second. That it was me. me. Oh, excuse me, Remy. And, and Mr. Mayor, I just asked for clarification on the record. The motion is to approve the ordinance. Okay. Okay, it is to approve ordinance 5088. Councillor Drapkin? Aye. Councillor Garvin? Nay. Councillor Geary? Nay. Councillor Staffens? Aye. Councillor Peralta? Aye. And Council President Minky? Aye. Ordinance number 5088 uh, passes four to two. That will take us to the second reading of ordinance number 5089. Uh, Spencer, if you could read that by title only. This is the second reading of ordinance number 5089, an ordinance approving a landscape plan and street tree plan for the Baker Creek North subdivision. Thank you. Do I have a, a motion? I so move. A second. Second. It's been moved by Kelly, seconded by Remy. I'll ask the city recorder to poll the council. And Mr. Mayor, again, just for clarification on the record, that motion is a motion to approve. Um, a motion to approve, excuse me. Councilor Drapkin? Aye. Councilor Garvin? Nay. Councilor Geary? Nay. Councilor Stephan? Aye. Councilor Peralta? Aye. And Council President Minky? Aye. After the roll call, uh, S-119 uh, is adopted by a vote of four to two. 
This takes us to a second reading of ordinance number 5086. Spencer, if you'd read that by title only. Oh, excuse me. Uh, we're looking at, uh, this takes us to uh, ordinance number 5089. And Spencer, if you could read that by title only. Mr. Mayor, we're, we're at the end of the line. We just did 5089. Okay. Well, that's what happens. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, so um, these are decisions of the City of McMinnville Council and are final decisions of the City of McMinnville unless appealed to the Land Use Board of Appeals. These decisions may be appealed to the Land Use Board of Appeals by filing notice with the Planning de Department within 21 days of the date the decision is mailed to those that participated in this hearing. Uh, thank you, Spencer, for leading us through that. Uh, thank you, Chuck, and the planning department. Uh, that takes us to the end of our agenda this evening. Uh, I will just ask any counselors if there's anything that needs to be brought up before we conclude our meeting this evening. I'd uh, make a request at the end of that. Uh, okay. If I have a second. So that, uh, multiple land use decisions and developments have been occurring out there and a theme of a lot of those uh, in the last few years has been traffic and whatever you make of the TSP, we're starting to get into F letter grades out there on Baker Creek and, and Michael Book specifically. And we, since we have a light planned in the transportation system plan far out there, I'd like to push to move that up the list to provide some uh, traffic congestion and degrading traffic grade traffic patterns uh, to provide some relief to those by moving that up the list of that project. So that'd be on my list of things to do. Okay. I'd, I'd like to uh, to second Zach's comment. I, I think that the that obviously we don't have control over the uh, ODOT controlled stops at 99W and Baker and Baker Creek, but uh, we do have some control over the uh, the light at Michael Brook and Baker Creek, and I think we should try and address that sooner rather than later if possible. I would tend to agree. I, I am concerned about the traffic patterns too, but at this point in time, it does need a code, so. And so the question I think is, if it's feasible, I mean, there's all sorts of issues here as far as how we get the money, et cetera. Right. But, you know, I, I think if it's um, a capacity issue, we've got to realize that. But even so, if we could take a look at it, it'd be nice. Yeah, it's on our plan, and and I'd like to just move it up the list on priority. Yeah, so If, if capacity-wise, we could do it. Anybody else like to weigh in on 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 the the intersection at uh, Michael Book and Baker Creek. I'd just like to ask Mike after the Old Sheridan Road project, which is obviously part of that bond. What is the next thing on the list that's in front of this light at Michael Book? Is he there? I am. Yeah. Sorry, I was muted. Um, so that's a wonderful question. Uh, uh, there isn't a capital improvement plan for the street system that has been developed or put in place. There is certainly a list of projects that's in the transportation system plan that address needs uh, in the system as we continue to grow. And so um, I think it's important for the council to remember that um, the studies, um, all of the recent studies you've seen um, indicate that the, the signal isn't warranted at that location currently. And it's um, not good practice to install traffic control in situations where it isn't warranted. It can actually make this situation more dangerous. And so we'll need to pay attention to that as that uh, delay increases, as the subdivisions get built out, we definitely need to pay attention to that. and, and there'll be a time where the signal is warranted and we need to be prepared to um, fund those improvements. Um, frankly, your biggest re uh, responsibility and, and need in the transportation network is the declining condition of your pavement. We've had that discussion over time, uh, had that discussion extensively when we put the bond package together. 
but we're um, nowhere near uh, the, the amount of money invested in the pavement system that we need to be to keep the system viable as at, uh, under current conditions without any growth. And so, you know, we'll have some decisions to make as a community moving forward on where the priorities are and uh, how we're gonna pay for those priorities. Um, but certainly your concerns about the traffic in that corridor are warranted. Um, they're heard loud and clear and um, all of us, um, policymakers and staff alike will need to pay attention to when that that need is warranted and when it is time to install that signal. Thank you, Mike, for that update. And, uh, you know, the, the thought might be, you know, as you're looking and you're going through your process to come back to us at a, at a, at a time and maybe in one of our work sessions where we can uh, have a clear understanding where that might fall uh, from a timing standpoint might be appropriate. Can I ask, Mike, a, a follow-up question? Sure. Um, so, Mike, what is the process for for paying attention to that? Are there regular times that we check traffic in that intersection? Or can you uh, educate me about the process for keeping an eye on that, knowing that that is something that we're going to need to be aware of that's coming up? Yeah, certainly. So um, there will be need, there will be need for further traffic studies to uh, to uh, analyze uh, uh, the capacity of those movements, um, and we'll, we'll need to program in um, as those subdivisions start to get built out uh, some money to complete those traffic studies. Um, it, it sort of imagine, if you will. Um, we get a couple of these phases built and we start to see um, more citizen complaints, more policymaker concerns, more law enforcement concerns that are a key partner in this. Um, there are eyes and ears in the transportation network. Certainly our partners in the fire and EMS service are also key partners. They let us know when we're starting to see uh, uh, accident potential and actual accident problems. And so it's a group effort. It's a collective community process. Um, I think it's also important to remember the journey that we're on with Heather's team uh, in the planning department regarding how we're going to grow. Um, and all of her work plans include updating all of our infrastructure plans and transportation will certainly be a key infrastructure plan that gets updated. And I would imagine that out of that updated TSP, there'll come a whole list of projects that as a community, we need to figure out how to fund much like we did with the transportation bond in 2014. Yeah, and if I, I can just follow up on that, um, we will be doing a transportation study for House Bill 2001 here in the next 12 months. Um, so we can look at that intersection as part of that process. And then also for the, um, the P82-19 that you passed tonight, embedded in that as a condition of approval to do a traffic impact analysis, that's the commercial um, piece of property when that comes in for development. And you also embedded in that, that they need to study this intersection. Traffic impact analysis that private developers are doing for us through land use decisions also help us to manage the system because it tells us where we're at with the counts and how, and how those intersections are performing. Thank, thank you, you, Heather. Does that answer your questions, Wendy? Yes, thank you okay. very much. Okay. I have another question for Mike, if, if that just jumps from a, a no light situation to a light situation, or if there's a, a gap in between there, or we put a, a monitored crosswalk, I don't know what the technical term is, but where they push the button and it flashes for kids to cross and things like that. That's an excellent question, Adam. I, I, um... I am not certain that the needs that have been identified at that particular intersection are pedestrian driven. Um, that area of the corridor is already well built out and, and the pedestrian traffic is fairly well established, but uh, much like anywhere in the system, if there are traffic safety concerns with pedestrian movements, that is an option that could be pursued and it certainly has a lower price point than a full traffic signal. Thank you. Any other questions? 
I think there's been enough uh, concern by council. So again, I'll just ask Mike and Heather to be aware of our concerns and take a look at, uh, you know, how that might work into uh, Heather's updating of the house bill that we just talked about. Okay, anything else? One last thing that I have tonight is that uh, March is National Child Abuse Prevention Month, and I have a, a proclamation that I'm going to deliver to the Juliet's House proclaiming March as National Child Abuse Prevention Month. I'm not gonna take the time to do that here, but I will meet with the Juliet's House and with, uh, with the group there and deliver the proclamation. With that, I will go ahead and adjourn our meeting this evening and thanks everyone for trying the new Can't technology. Hear you, Jeff, at all. Okay. Or Scott, I can't hear you at all. He's adjourning the meeting. <laughs> <Lost it. laughs> we are adjourned.